Hey guys, welcome back. So for this one, we are getting into Avengers Assemble Omega. And oh man, this one's been a long time coming and it's dense. And by chance, if any of you guys are just hopping in here at the conclusion, I got a playlist down in the description that'll get you all caught up with everything that has led up to this point. So with that said, let's get into it. But first, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to catch the spills every week. And don't forget to hit that bell up top to get all notifications so we can squat up in the comments for the first hour. All right, so coming back for the conclusion of Avengers Assemble, there's quite a few things that have compounded into this chaotic moment that I wanna go over before we dive in. Cause right now at Infinity's End, the God Quarry's been broken open as the result of a number of things. Cause for starters, you got the fight here, which began with the army of Mephistos versus the multiversal Avengers that initially took its toll on the God Quarry. But then you stack on top of that, the Doom Above All and his army bringing their fight here, only to then have the Quarry pounded on by your super-sized Mighty Morphin Mephisto, which was then followed by Thor and the Phoenix Force combining their power to knock the Dark Phoenix mystique right into it, creating the opportunity for Mephisto to sample from the entropy leaking out and power himself up even further just so he could hit the God Quarry again, releasing the waters of entropy. Cause as we're told, the God Quarry was actually a dam, holding back the all-consuming waters of entropy, with these dark waters containing the rotting remains of the first firmament, that at one time was the fertile compost that the Omniverse grew from. So yeah, heading into this conclusion, everything we've talked about leading up to here has brought us to the point of what could potentially be the end of everything. So those are the stakes that we're dealing with here. And right now, as the waters of entropy come spewing up out of the bedrock, just about everyone is making a run for it. Cause if enough of this stuff gets on you, you're done. Or better yet, undone. And I say that just about everyone's making a run for it because it's right here where we see 616 Captain America racing right into the danger, telling the other Avengers to gather the wounded and get them to higher ground, which really I wouldn't expect him to do any different in this situation. And right away, 616 Iron Man lets him know that there is no higher ground. And what they need to do is get everyone here to Avengers Mountain and teleport out of here. Only for Odin to tell them both that there's no running from this. Because this flood will sweep across realities, drowning civilizations, planets, and universes. Which then has Cap like, well, okay, well, how do we stop it? As he does parkour around these crashing death waves. But all he hears in return is radio silence because no one has that answer. So 616 Cap just continues to do what he can by helping those closer to the breach get further away from it. And as he does, we see him save the dog Steve Rogers that we were introduced to in Avengers Forever issue 7. But as he saves him, we're given another example of what the dark waters can do on contact as some of it splashes on Cap's shield, melting it away. And with the waves literally splashing on his heels, a huge wall of Phoenix fire comes through, separating the dark water from the rest of the heroes, so they look up to see old man Phoenix holding the waves back as he looks down and tells them, whatever they plan to do, make it quick, because even the Phoenix Force can't hold this back for long. But just after this, we go back over to Mephisto for a moment, where in his case, we quickly find out that he wasn't able to sustain the immense amount of power that he acquired when he sampled the raw entropy from the God Quarry, which is something that I would have liked to have seen a bit more of as far as the overpowered Mephisto wreaking havoc. But I also imagine at some point, Jason Aaron was being told to wrap it up and that's why we didn't get too much of it. But also the concept is understandable as far as Mephisto not being able to control omniversal entropy because by definition, it's unpredictable. So I get that. But as Mephisto returns to his regular form, he's approached by the Doom Above All who pretty much rubs it in his face while telling Mephisto the only reason he wanted to erase all of reality was because he couldn't control the power anyway, which on the surface seems like a valid assumption. But instead of just letting Doom Supreme think what he wants to think, Mephisto opens up here and he tells Doom the true reason why he wanted to erase everything. And the truth is Mephisto's tired because he's been reigning in hell longer than humanity's been alive. And sure, over the eons, he's had his moments of enjoyment, like at the sight of a sniveling lecherous priest being flayed alive. But he goes on to tell Doom Supreme that hell makes slaves of us all. Sooner or later, even the devil who sits on the throne, which is why I decided to free myself from the monotony of eternal damnation once and for all. After this flood sweeps across creation, there will be no more life, no more afterlife. No more sinners or saints to make scream and suffer. Nothing but grand and glorious silence. Stretching into infinity. How beautiful it will be. Which, yeah. 
That was Mephisto's motive for all of this from the beginning. And though I don't agree with Mephisto's actions with everything that's brought us here, I felt that speech. He got the tears coming down, Mephisto may cry out here. You can tell he needed to get this off his chest. So the Doom Above All gives him a bit of help with that by blasting through Mephisto's back and out of his chest the remaining portion of the entropy that Mephisto wielded while telling Mephisto, okay, long story short, you wish to die, I got you. But before you go, gaze upon the man who will embrace all that made the devil himself cower. This power you have unleashed in great quantities, it overwhelms and destroys, but in controlled doses, it can be harnessed and wielded. I sympathize, Mephisto, with your detesting of mankind's tedium. Which is why, after I have used this power to remake the multiverse, only Doom will remain. But before Doom can make use of the entropy, it grows exponentially after being hit by Stark particles that were compliments of the Ant-Man from Earth-818, who was like, oh, my bad, looks like your controlled dose suddenly turned into one of those great quantities that overwhelms and destroys, and it's enough to make a 616 Tony proud, as he tells him, good job, Ant-Me, as the Doom Above All just turns to stone, like the rest of the gods here. So 818 Tony shrinks him down and picks him up, and he looks at Mephisto like, okay, you're next. But as it stands right now, they really don't have the time to worry about Mephisto, because they still need to seal the breach in the God Quarry. And even now with the Avenger Prime Loki and Agamotto himself trying to seal it, the power of the First Firmament refuses to yield. And also, even with the Doom Above All defeated, his army is still fighting. So really, the war continues while they're still trying to find a solution to save the Omniverse from oblivion. Because right now, Old Man Phoenix is still trying to keep the waves at bay while this insane power is causing his adamantium bones to buckle. And even now with Valkyrie using the all weapon to hold Old Man Phoenix together, this still isn't a permanent solution. So they've got to figure out something quick. And the next thing we see is the Deathlock Progenitor, Avengers Mountain, step forward to give them a hand, literally, by placing his hand right on top of the opening but almost immediately, the insane amount of power begins to tear him apart. So Thor and the goddesses of Thunder, Iron Man, and Starbrand, they all jump in and attempt to cauterize the wounds in real time. But even still, the Deathlock progenitor is tearing apart so quickly that it's clear to them that this ain't gonna do it either. Meanwhile, Maya Lopez and the Phoenix Avatar from 1 million BC, they're both attacked by Raven, the Dark Phoenix, who just dunks the both of them into the entropy juice. <laughs> but because it's been established that this won't kill a Phoenix right away, we're given this brief moment while they're under where the prehistoric Phoenix tells Maya to focus on the thing that she cherishes and use it. Because the Phoenix Force is a force of chaos, of change, of unquenchable passion. The Phoenix is a force of love, which right there I imagine quite a few people are going to find that statement controversial, which is fine, but I also believe that there's more information over the history of the Phoenix that supports it. If you just look at the Phoenix for what it is, the spark of creation, the cycle of life, death, and rebirth, it checks out. But I can't help but to add here that I believe this is still us seeing some of the signs of what Jason Aaron intended to do with the Phoenix being Thor's mother and how that got scaled back over the past couple of years. And it leads me to believe that maybe Jason Aaron was hoping to lean into more of the life and rebirth aspects of the Phoenix Force, which we've only really seen from Chris Claremont and Grant Morrison, because most of the time when we see the Phoenix Force, it's just about death and destruction. So maybe Jason Aaron was trying to balance that out. I'm just guessing, because at this point, it's just one of those things where it's like, I guess we'll never know. But nonetheless, it's this ideology that the prehistoric Phoenix uses alongside of Maya Lopez to overpower Raven and tear off her wings, which then sends her plummeting into the entropy. Meanwhile, with the Deathlock Progenitor, he's forced to let go after nearly losing his hand. And I mean, at one point, someone says that he lost his hand, but it's not actually gone. It's just really, really messed up. So the prehistoric Phoenix and Maya Lopez jump in to help old man Phoenix, but they're weakened because of their battle with Mystique. So the prehistoric Phoenix is like, oh, we need more fire. So fire god Thor Odinson steps in using the flames he was gifted on the day he was born. The fire of the mighty Thor, son of the Thunderbird, which I mean, at this point, I don't need to say too much about that. But right now with them still needing a permanent solution, this causes both Robbie Reyes and Brandy Selby to go back and forth on which one of them is going to be to sacrifice everything to get this done. Cause like we saw before, it's pretty much curtains for the both of them. So Robbie Reyes, the all rider, he just steps forward and reassembles what's left of Doom the Living Planet and sends it right down into the breach. 
Because also around this time, you had some of these guys asking like, what happened to Galactus? And Kazar tells them, Galactus dipped out as soon as he saw the dam bro. He just went back to his own time. Like what, the end of the universe? Not doing this again. But right now, with Robbie plugging this leak with a moon-sized flaming planet, only to see it begin to break up, which Mephisto's not mad about because he wants it all to end anyway. But right here, Avenger Prime Loki realizes the reason why nothing's working is because nothing from this side can hold back that energy. So if they want to stop this, the solution has to come from the other side. So Valkyrie and all the Thors get all the hammers to hold Doom the Living Planet together just a little bit longer as Brandy Selby comes forth saying, okay, that's it. She's ready to go in there and do what needs to be done. But like we saw before, Brandy, she's literally still just a child. So Robbie Reyes beats her to the punch again. And he first tells Captain America and Captain Marvel to take care of his brother Gabe. As he takes off and Brandy tries to race him to it while telling Robbie that this is why she's here, it has to be her, only for Robbie to tell her that it isn't. And no one can outrace the All Rider. So Robbie just goes full speed through the Doom Above All, through the breach, into the abyss, on some stand up in the motor busted dashboard type mess, full speed, to break up the bedrock from the other side. And it works, because Robbie Reyes, the All Rider, made the ultimate sacrifice to save all of existence. And we also get this moment where Nighthawk just punches Mephisto while telling him, yeah, I wanted to do that for a long time. Like he might as well have just said that was for Heroes Reborn Volume 2, because we know what you really mean. And next, Agamotto sends Mephisto off to the last place that he wants to go, which is back to his realm, back to hell. Which now has Mephisto feeling like, man, this is a lot worse than it was before. Because this time when he returns to his throne, he finds Orb sitting right there with him. Who, Like we saw, this guy died back in issue 50 of Avengers. And now that he's dead and here in hell, he has someone to talk to for eternity. But back at Infinity's End, when it comes to the rest of the heroes, there's a number of solutions that need to be made. Because for all the variants who had their timelines altered back when the Masters of Evil were hunting down their prehistoric Avengers, their worlds have been changed and those changes made them the heroes that they are. So for a moment, they go back and forth on whether they should fix it and pretty much undo themselves, which is something that Weapon America wouldn't mind. But for others like this Steve Rogers, who spent most of his life jumping from one nervous hospital to another, he doesn't want to go back to that. So the heroes from other worlds, they take a moment here to figure out what their next step's gonna be and what that looks like. Meanwhile, the prehistoric Phoenix, she steps over to the side to have a conversation with Brandy Selby, the star brand who now that everything's over, she really doesn't know what her purpose is. But a few things happen here in this moment, cause for one, you have the Deathlock Celestial, who's feeling a bit of a guilt trip for him playing his part on helping Brandy get to this point, but she more or less just tells him to save his tears. So what ends up happening here, much like the conclusion of Heroes Reborn and Heroes Return, when Brandy Selby had to team up with Maya Lopez to combine the power of the Star Brand and the Phoenix, to change things back to normal, we pretty much get the same thing happening here. Cause as it turns out, after all this time, this is Brandy's purpose, which makes for a rather sad moment. Cause on one hand, Maya Lopez is like, no, it's supposed to be me. Why can't I take her place? Cause this time around, they're resetting more than just one earth because the masters of evil conquered and altered 615 earths before making their way to earth 616. So now with this happening again, but on a much larger scale, it now just causes everyone to assume that this is the end for the prehistoric Phoenix and Brandy, though we're not given a definitive answer to that. But we are told that even with them resetting these different 615 Earths, it doesn't undo the heroes at the God Quarry. They still remain, which again is just like what we saw in Heroes Reborn and Heroes Return, because after that was done, we still got Nighthawk alongside of the Squadron Supreme that we were given from that story. But nonetheless, with Old Man Phoenix seeing this happen, he sheds a tear and bids them farewell. And after that, the Avengers 1 million BC return back to their time in the prehistoric era of Earth 616. And as they do, a now blind Agamotto creates multiple eyes to see for him since he no longer has his natural sight. And with doing this, he looks forward into the future, seeing things like the age of heroes, as well as mutants coming of age, having powers that defy the imagination, which for the most part, these are things we've seen in the comics for the past 70 years that Agamotto's looking forward at and seeing for the first time. But as he leaves this cave with a prehistoric Iron Fist and Moon Knight, we get a glimpse at the cave paintings that'll later become an Easter egg for a previous issue. And as we go to Asgard, still one million years in the past, we see Odin set down Mjolnir and swear that he'll never use the hammer again, which in this case just sets things up for the future where a young Thor would often come here and admire the hammer before he could lift it. And speaking of the future, from here we head into the far future, the home of the goddesses of thunder, 
where it's here on the Midgard that was restored by King Thor's blood. We find that the Goddesses of Thunder have already returned all the hammers from across the multiverse to their rightful worlds, so now in New Midgard they all just kinda share Mjolnir, and for the most part things go back to normal for them. But aside from that, the new addition that we get here is that Old Man Phoenix has now made his home here. He's pretty much just relaxing and gardening with his adamantium claws while speaking to old King Thor through the earth that King Thor is more or less a part of now since it was restored with his blood. And for a moment, Old Man Phoenix speaks of the days of him using the Phoenix Force as a thing of the past. So as it would seem from this point going forward, he's no longer an avatar which is undoubtedly the case for Maya Lopez, who we find in the present day with Thor in Asgard, as Thor introduces her to his two mothers after she fought alongside of him to save all of reality. And after this, staying in the present day, we see Nighthawk continuing his search for the Squadron Supreme, though he's not really sure of how much time he has left or if he'll fade from existence. So in the meantime, he's just gonna continue as Marvel's We Got Batman at Home. And in the case of Namor, he ends up turning himself in and serving time at Seagate Prison for pretty much everything he did in Avengers Volume 8 leading up to the Death Hunters event when he joined the Avengers to make things right. But when everything's said and done, they're like, nah, bro, you still going to jail. <laughs> it's kind of wild. And it's really messed up because helping to save all of existence, you would think that would earn you a reduced sentence or better yet, avoid jail time. But nah, not for Namor. He still gets locked up, which he agrees to go along with for now. And next, when we head over to the North Pole, where Avengers Mountain used to be, now that it's gone, we find all the heroes are gathered here, alongside of Gabe Reyes, Robbie's little brother, to pay their respects to Brandy Selby and Robbie Reyes, who they've created this monument for, so that they'll always be remembered, for giving the ultimate sacrifice to save all of existence. But just after this, when we head over to Valkyrie, we find that she's made an interesting discovery. Or really, it's what she didn't discover that's interesting. Because for her, after searching the afterlife for Brandy and Robbie, she couldn't find either one of them in any heaven or hell. Which for a moment had her concerned about their eternal rest situation until Mr. Horse tells her that it's likely because they're still alive somewhere, waiting to be reborn. And from here, we then head over to Infinity's End, with the Deathlock Progenitors now serving a new purpose by going back to work with Avenger Prime, but this time, he's serving as a base of operations and helping the remaining variants to make their way out to the different 615 worlds to pretty much patrol and do reconnaissance while reporting back to Avenger Prime, which these guys are more than happy to do because they feel like they owe it to the Phoenix and the Star Brand for resetting their worlds and sparing them in the process, which from here kind of gives us the ending of this story. But before it's completely done, we do get a bit of a post credit scene because the last thing that we're shown takes place far under the God Quarry where we see the pieces of the Hell Charger being collected by chains and brought together as the All Rider rebuilds his vehicle and waits for the opportunity to take one more ride, which is the long ride home, so he can get back to his little brother Gabe. So yeah, it's a lot of stuff to process here, but this is effectively the ending of Avengers Volume 8, Avengers Forever Volume 2, and Avengers Assemble. And so now real quick, I want to give a special shout out to all the patrons. Thank you guys for all of your support. And for anyone who's new here, who wants more information on how to support the channel, I got a link below where you can go to patreon.com slash dopespill. But that'll do it for this one, guys. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below, and we'll do it again on the next one. All right, later.